Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Last time we covered 11 so-called quick facts from ICR, and today we're going to cover 10 more. As a reminder, the whole video used the music extensively, and I've had to do some pretty heavy editing to get rid of most of it to avoid copyright problems. As a result, the audio is not very good. I hope that's okay. We're starting off with the seven day week. So a day is how long it takes the Earth to rotate once on its axis, and a year is how long it takes for Earth to orbit once around the Sun. But why is a week seven days long? Well, conventional scholarly dating of most of the Torah puts it somewhere in the Babylonian exile, and the seven-day week was an ancient tradition there, and contrasted with the ten-day week in Egypt and the eight-day week in the Italian peninsula. Now, Deuteronomy was probably written about the time of King Josiah, and probably was the book that he claimed to find in the temple. While the rest of the Torah was probably around in some form or another, it wouldn't be compiled into the familiar form for another century or two during the Babylonian exile. Certainly before this time, Canaan was under heavy cultural influence from Mesopotamia, and during the exile, a Mesopotamian culture was dominant. It seems quite likely that the seven-day work week in pre-common era Judaism is an import from Mesopotamia. Because of the cultural dominance of Babylon, the concept spread through the world, both east and west. By the time of the 4th century, the seven-day work week had spread to China in the east, perhaps by Manichaeans, a group practicing a religion that seems to have been a syncretism between various forms of Christianity, as well as religious traditions from both Persia and India. Emperor Constantine the Great officially declared the Roman week to be seven days, probably in line with his general, though not exclusive, support for Christianity after making the religion legal to practice in the empire. From there, the week more or less spread with Christianity. It was picked up in Islam, which is heavily influenced by both rabbinic Judaism as well as Christianity. Now, two major proselytizing and to varying degrees conquering religions spread the concept around the world. And hey, compared to smallpox or paying taxes in the form of giving up your children to slavery and castration, you know, the seven-day work week isn't really the worst gift Christianity and Islam have bestowed on the world. After all, there isn't an astronomical reason behind a seven-day long week. That's kind of like saying there isn't an astronomical reason for the length of an hour. Yes, there is. The period of a day is divided into whole numbers of hours. The length of an hour was fundamentally set by the length of the day. The length of one quarter of a full set of moon phases is 3.357 days, which is inconveniently not a whole number. But the nearest whole number is 7. The 7 day week is quite possibly meant to be roughly a quarter of a moon cycle. This is backed up by the fact that the peoples who seem to have invented it, the Babylonians, use the moon to mark years, as does the Hebrew calendar, which prefers to add whole months as leap years rather than single days, being a lunisolar calendar. Similarly, the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar with moon-based months, a 7 day week, and even abandoned leap years, which is why Islamic holy days move around the calendar, and why the year is shorter than a solar year. Also, I have to point out that if God had designed the week supernaturally, couldn't he have just moved the moon a bit closer so that it actually took four times seven days? And said, no, we actually get an orbital period of under 28 days, which when coupled with the movement of the Earth around the sun, creates a period between moon phases of about 29 and a half days. This is very inconvenient. Or perhaps even better, why not make the time between phases a highly composite number? 24 seems like a pretty great number. It's evenly divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 12, meaning weeks could be 6 days, and you could easily have an exactly 4-week month, which can be split into whole numbers of day fractions 7 ways, including days. Oh well, instead we have this messy world where astronomical time periods don't line up with each other, despite ostensibly being created to help humans keep time. Or why we traditionally work for 6 of those days and rest on the 7th. The point of weeks was generally to help with some kind of rhythm. A particular day of the week, either at the beginning or end, has been traditional since basically weeks started. Since otherwise, what's the point really? Some say the practice came from market days, but even market days clustered around every seventh day instead of every 15th or 19th or some other day. Right, which is why it's a good explanation for the ultimate origin of weeks of that period. You can't just say however and then state something that supports the idea you're trying to dismiss and pretend that it doesn't support the idea. Well, I mean, you can but it's clearly dumb. Others believe that the seven-day week started with Moses and the Ten Commandments. If Moses is based on a real person at all, he was not a man who led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. There was no time when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. They grew out of the cultural milieu in Canaan. There was no exodus, no wandering the deserts, or giving of the law at Mount Sinai. 
Sorry. But the people that became Israel and other nations observed the Sabbath long before Moses was alive. Instead, we have to go back to Genesis, where it says God created for six days and then rested on the seventh. Okay, but this doesn't explain the existence of similarly old week conventions like the 10-day Egyptian work week. If a week convention needs a divine origin, then which god told the Egyptians to have a 10-day week? And that's how we've modeled our week since then. Since the events that we know didn't happen. Got it. The Soviets tried to change the week to five days in 1929, but this didn't help productivity and ruin family life since people had different days off from work. Also, machines couldn't handle the constant use and would often break down. So they switched to a six-day week in 1931, but when that didn't work out either, they restored the seven-day week in 1940. I really don't know what various silly Soviet experiments in social engineering have to do with anything, but okay. If the point is to get me to say that the Soviets did dumb things, it's not that hard. They did a lot of really dumb things. Some much dumber than this. You know, like abandoning evolutionary biology in favor of Lysenkoism. That didn't just cause family stress or machine wear and tear. It caused famines that killed millions. Seven just seems to work out better when it comes to days in the week. And that's a great testimony to the fact of creation, that we observe the same seven-day week God established when he first created us. That cultures heavily influenced by a particular set of books, in this case the Bible, are in fact influenced by them, is not exactly an argument, it's just a tautology. Second in this set, and 13th overall, we have Creation Days. Genesis says that God created the universe in six days, but some people question what the word day means. What is a creation day? It's a literary device dividing up the forming and filling functions of God and his divine counsel during the creation week which was mostly in line with earlier accounts of creation right down to the earth being brought about by the taming of the Tahom, or Great Deep, which is probably cognate with Tiamat, the watery chaos dragon goddess of Mesopotamian myth, who had to be slain to create the world, a connection only strengthened in the telling of the myth of God slaying the Leviathan in Psalm 74, which depicts Leviathan as a multi-headed water serpent, just like Tiamat. Most students are told that the earth is 4.6 billion years old, Yes, because that's where every shred of empirical evidence points. Let me guess, we're about to have that countered with Mahoney book, and that the rest of the universe is a lot older. Again, because of all that pesky, you know, evidence. And so many Christians try to add billions of years into the Bible's timeline. Good for them for accepting the evidence of science. I wish more people would do so. It's kind of why I bother with this channel. Well, and also because I enjoy bad financial decisions. On an unrelated note, did you know that you can get a 12% discount on my Patreon for pledging annually? And you'll get early access to all my scripted videos. You could have seen this video months ago. Unless you're actually watching this video in early access. In which case, thanks. One of the most common ways is to say that the days of creation were vast ages, perhaps hundreds of millions of years each. We call this the day-age theory. While that was a common idea, it seems to me that it has fallen out of favor with Christianity polarizing toward the basically science-accepting theistic evolution side and the entirely science-rejecting young Earth creation side. ICR represents a fringe of that fringe, although there are fringes even to that fringe, like the fringe of the Creation Evidence Museum of Carl Baugh or Dinosaur Adventureland, run allegedly fraudulently by convicted felon, convicted wife beater, and alleged enabler of at least one child abuser, Kent Hovind. Oh, did I mention he let a kid drown on his property too? Yeah, that happened, and all he cared about was the PR. Day-age advocates say that the Hebrew word for day can sometimes mean a long period of time. I'm not here to debate the theological significance of Genesis. I'm here for evidence, so we're skipping a bit. Now, what about those 4.6 billion years? Well, this is based on really shaky dating methods that presuppose a lot of things. They presuppose nothing but what all science presupposes, that the way the universe works does not arbitrarily change through time and space. The physics yesterday are the same as the physics 2,000 years ago, 2 million years ago, and 2 billion years ago. Including evolution. Boy, was I wrong. The only dating technique I'm aware of that assumes evolution is molecular clock dating, which is used to estimate divergence time between lineages in evolution. But those aren't used to date the age of the Earth. They aren't based on real, repeatable science. Such speculations are no match for God's written record, the eyewitness account of creation. And he says the creation days are ordinary 24-hour days. According to Young Earth creationists, a notoriously dishonest lot, who in this case, as in most cases, either simply ignore or lie about science to bolster their belief. Well, our third fact for today, and 14th overall, is Night Sky.
If you're in the city, you probably don't get to see many stars in the night. But if you're camping, live out in the country, or are on a ship at sea, you can see hundreds or even thousands of them. That's true. That's why I really recommend that at least once in your life you go out to such a place and gaze up at the night sky to see it as your ancestors did before light pollution became so ubiquitous. From down here, stars pretty much look the same. But the Bible says that God made each one unique, like our sun. Did you know that our sun is over a million times bigger than the Earth? Shut up about the sun! SHUT UP ABOUT THE SUN! You know, the sun, rather definitionally, is only up in the daytime sky, not the night sky, which is what this segment is called. Weird. That's pretty big. But other stars are larger, like Betelgeuse, which is about a thousand times the size of the sun. Okay, that's big number, therefore God. If you have big number, therefore God in your bingo card, please mark it off. Once again, that's big number, therefore God. And like stars, each galaxy is uniquely designed. Whoa, hold up there, tiger. You never argue that stars were designed. You just pointed out that they are unique, which is hard to see how they could not be unless they had the exact same number of the exact same types of atoms in exactly the same place, which is fantastically unlikely. And even if two stars were like that, they wouldn't stay that way because of the inherently stochastic nature of particle physics that governs what goes on in the star's cores. In fact, if all stars were the same, now that would be evidence of design. Design things are more often recognizable by their uniformity than their uniqueness. You can't simply go from asserting that stars are designed to saying that because they're designed in some way, so are galaxies. It's like skipping eight steps or something, including the first one. Astronomers estimate that there are more than 170 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and they all come in different shapes. Our Milky Way, for instance, is a barred spiral galaxy, and while other barred spirals are out there, none of them are quite the same. And that's just one more thing we can be thankful for, as we look at the big and beautiful night sky that God made for us. Be thankful all you want, the night sky is really cool, but unless you can give a reason why a naturalistic explanation for the origin of stars and galaxies would predict uniformity, this isn't an argument in favor of intelligent design of stars and galaxies. Next up is our fourth topic for today, and the 15th overall, it's blue stars. The three bright blue stars that make up Orion's belt look pretty small up in the night sky, but actually blue stars are some of the most massive and brightest stars in the whole universe. Stars burn hydrogen for fuel, and blue stars have a lot of hydrogen. Our sun has enough hydrogen to keep burning for around 10 billion years. So far so good, although in later stages of life stars confuse other elements. You know, not the worst analogy, as long as you accept that distance is an analogy for time. But yes, stars burn for a time inversely proportional to their mass. This is why blue stars are closely associated with areas that contain protostars, such as Orion's belt, or the spiral arms of galaxies. They don't last as long as main sequence stars, so they are only really seen in areas actively forming new stars. Because in the time it would take for them to leave such areas, they've already gone nova or supernova. Blue stars have much more than that, but they won't last as long because they burn through it so much faster. Many blue stars shine 200 times brighter than our sun because they burn their fuel so quickly. Blue stars are like SUVs. They have a big gas tank, but very poor mileage. I mean, in that their light moves mostly unobstructed, yes, but that's just kind of how light works. And they illuminate all parts of the night sky. But they're not evenly distributed at all. They're much more common in certain parts of galaxies than others, our galaxy included. How do so many short-lived stars exist in a universe that is supposedly 13.8 billion years old? New ones are created via gravitational collapse of hydrogen clouds. Creationists, I really need you to hear me on this one. The fact that there are things that are younger than the universe doesn't indicate that the universe can't be older than those things. This is the same as saying that since the Gospel of John was written in the 2nd century, so was the rest of the Bible. It's incredibly dumb, and it makes you look extremely stupid when you say things like that. This is the kind of logic that first graders can understand. Please stop making these arguments. If your argument doesn't even follow logically if the premises are granted, which this one doesn't, it's definitely a bad argument. Secular scientists think that stars constantly form as a result of gas clouds being compressed together, even though none of them have ever seen this. Secular scientists believe that giant sequoias grow from tiny seeds, even though none of them have seen this happen. Just because a process isn't observable in a human lifetime doesn't mean humans can't figure out what's going on and what the stages of it are. And just like all the stages of the giant sequoia life cycle are easily observable, so too are all the stages of the stellar life cycle. And for the same reasons, humans can conclude that neither is simply a miracle 
that popped into existence, but that both populations have processes which create new members and that cause old members to leave the population. Plus, gas particles and clouds bounce against one another. This outward force far exceeds the inward pulling force of gravity. Well, that's temperature dependent, and if gas is cold enough, that pressure is easily overcome by gravity, at which point gravity remains dominant even after temperatures begin to rise. Blue stars churn through their own fuel so fast that they cannot last billions of years. Again, just because something isn't as old as the universe doesn't mean the universe isn't older than that thing. Heck, by all accounts, the person watching this isn't as old as the universe. Yet I don't think you think the universe started with your birth or conception. And based on their observed luminosity, the most massive blue stars cannot last even one million years before running out of fuel. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, as secularists claim, blue stars should not be here anymore. Unless new ones form, which we do. But they are, and we find them all throughout the universe. Yeah, in regions with lots of protostars and hydrogen clouds. You know, the kind of place you'd expect if current ideas about stellar formation were true. Weird, isn't it? As God said through his prophet Isaiah, My hands stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. Always fun when a creationist who pretends to pride themselves on their literal interpretation of the narrative of the Bible uses a verse about God placing a solid dome over the flat earth as an argument. Blue stars fit perfectly with the Bible's idea of recent creation. So, next time you see a blue star, think of our creator, whose hands created the whole universe. Hey, I'm not going to tell you not to think of God when you look at the stars. But I will say that blue stars are in no way evidence of a young universe. Our fifth topic today, and 16th overall, is second law, presumably of thermodynamics. Although maybe we'll get some genetic entropy in there too. Who knows? Nothing hits the spot on a freezing day like a bowl of hot soup. But don't leave it out too long, because all that warm goodness will quickly escape, making it cold and unappetizing. That's science in action, by the way. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Yes, this is indeed an example of the second law of thermodynamics in action. This is probably most easily seen by using the quantum microstate explanation for the second law. Any given system that can be observed classically is in fact made up of quantum objects at the smallest scale, and those objects must be in some state, but for any given classically measurable variable like bulk mass, temperature, etc., there are a number of such states the quantum objects could take that would be functionally indistinguishable. However, many states would not be indistinguishable. Statistically, the number of states in which there is no energy flow in the system are the largest set of states, and the states with less energy flow are proportionally more likely the less energy flow there is. As a result, systems tend towards reducing energy flow in the system and maximizing the number of microstates the classical macrostate can accommodate. As a result, heat flows from hot to cold until an equilibrium is reached. It is statistically possible to go the other way since fundamentally quantum mechanics is stochastic, but it's wildly improbable to the point that we can assume it simply doesn't happen. Now, this trend can be offset by adding energy to the system, such as heating the soup. So this trend only fully applies in isolated systems. That is, systems where neither energy nor matter may enter or leave. The universe as a whole seems to be such a system, but Earth is not. For the law of entropy, history credits French military engineer Sadiq Carnot as the scientist who laid the foundation for the second law. In his 1824 book, Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, which talked about heat and steam engines. Yup, in fact, the theoretical maximum efficiency you can get from a heat engine is called Carnot efficiency, and is calculated using a formula he derived. It's important to note, though, that Carnot efficiency can only be achieved in a true isolated system without friction, so, you know, it can't be achieved. But still, it's a useful benchmark. Scientists today use the second law to describe anything that naturally goes from a state of order to disorder. Incorrect. You can lower entropy and become less ordered trivially easy. A grid of snowflakes, all with their six-fold symmetry, and all ordered in rows and columns of even length and separation, is highly ordered. Add some heat to them, and melt them, and they'll become much more disordered. But entropy has still gone down. Human understandings of chaos and order have nothing to do with entropy. Those ideas barely map onto each other at all, never mind one-to-one -one like creationists like to say that they do. Like your car. Even if you maintain it like you should, it will eventually need to be replaced. This may be the result of some kind of entropy, such as oxidation reactions, which tend to reduce the amount of chemical energy in a system, transferring it to thermal energy, which then dissipates increasing entropy in the car slash air system. But finding examples of increasing entropy leading to disorder is not a counter to the fact that there are examples of decreasing entropy leading to disorder. 
it cuts both ways. Entropy affects everything, from cells in your body to the magnetic fields of planets, which run out of energy over time, like regular magnets. Not quite. Permanent magnets and planetary magnetic fields are distinct phenomena, and they do not act in the same way. One of the ways permanent magnets are formed is by putting usually molten magnetic material in a strong magnetic field, generally generated by electricity, so that as they cool, they do so with the magnetic dipoles of their constituent atoms aligned with the field in which they were created. As time wears on, heat and mechanical disturbances can knock some of these atoms out of alignment, weakening the overall strength of the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. To see how this ties back to entropy, let's remember microstates and macrostates. Imagine each magnetic particle in the permanent magnet as a coin, and we have, say, 100 of them, all showing heads. Well, we have a maximum field strength here, and only one possible microstate can exist. Here, the exact state of each coin is the microstate, and the proportion of them showing heads or tails is the macrostate. But what if the field weakens by a single coin turning to tails? How many possible microstates can describe that? Well, 100. But then it weakens again with another coin flipping. Well, that's 9,900 microstates that can describe that macrostate. But if it weakens yet again, we're at 970,200. You can see that until we get to 50-50 and a field strength of zero, each weakening of the field can be explained by far more microstates. And this is why with only 100 elements, a real permanent magnet will be made of billions of elements. Given the stochastic nature of quantum mechanics, as well as the fact that things like heating episodes and mechanical disturbance of permanent magnets are generally not very directed towards increasing field strength, as a matter of chance, the magnet should tend towards macrostates that can be accounted for by more microstates. This means that over time, the field strength of a permanent magnet will tend to decrease towards a limit of zero. Now, the scope of this video does not include an entire description of how planetary magnetic fields work, but they are not made of frozen-in-place magnetic particles like a permanent magnet. They are the result of the movement of magnetic materials in a molten state deep inside the planet. Their strength varies up and down with variations in this movement, and they can even switch direction. Until the whole planet freezes solid, they are not analogous to permanent magnets, nor can variation in their field strength and direction be directly attributed to entropy in the same way. So, for example, the magnetic field of Mars is probably akin to a permanent magnet, but this is certainly not true for Earth or Jupiter, both of which have active cores producing a field which will vary, but is simply not decaying in the way a permanent magnet will. On Earth, we can see this in the Atlantic Ocean, where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the fault that separates the two sides of the ocean and which is spreading. As it spreads, magnetic rock is deposited on either side, and as these rocks cool from lava, the magnetic components align with the direction of Earth's magnetic field and the degree to which they align is proportional to the strength of that field. The rock record has many fluctuations in both strength and direction of the electromagnetic field of Earth, which does not show any long-term weakening trend. That's why some scientists doubt that nature can ever make anything better through evolution. There just is no connection between these things. A statistical model of microstates, or if we go with the more classical level definition, the ability of an isolated system to do work, in no way informs us about anything to do with natural selection, sexual selection, drift, or mutation. This is just an extension of the never-valid metaphor of order for entropy into biology, and then importing the largely irrelevant concept of entropy into biology. Not that organisms don't have to account for entropy on small scales, but it simply is not anything to do with evolution on the whole beyond providing selection pressures. Like turning bacteria into people. Something that neither happened nor would be prevented by the second law of thermodynamics. Plus, the Bible is clear that creation would go from order to disorder because sin and death entered the world. And that's exactly what we see happening all around us. So you'd better go ahead and eat that soup before it gets cold. Okay, but that things die and decay isn't some amazing insight the Bible had. And the fact that the ancient Hebrews had myths to explain it doesn't make them special. Every culture did. Nothing about having a myth to describe an easily observable phenomenon makes the second law of thermodynamics a problem for evolution or any other part of science that creationists don't like, which again, is basically all of it. Our sixth topic today is science in scripture, which is also our 17th overall. I'm guessing I'll either have a lot to say or basically nothing to say. Let's find out, shall we? Scientists find inspiration in all sorts of places. That's true. Yep, but those places that inspire them don't actually do anything to help evidence the ideas that are inspired. That's something for the data to do. One famous example is the story of Isaac Newton's falling apple. Which probably isn't true, but whatever. Many engineers today look to shrimp, bees, woodpeckers, fish scales, the human brain, and other places in our world to design faster computers, better shock absorbers, and even stronger body armor. 
Well, first scientists and engineers aren't the same thing, but of course they do. Natural selection has had millions of years, or in some cases, billions of years, to get these things right. And while natural selection doesn't result in perfect function in any of these things, it results in very good function many times. In some cases, beyond what humans have been able to think of without reference to nature. But that's a prediction of evolutionary biology, and also special creation. So this fact alone can't be used to differentiate between the two ideas. Archaeologists and geologists have even been inspired by the ancient writings of Plato, who described the lost city of Atlantis more than 2,500 years ago. What does this have to do with anything? But what about scientists who get ideas from the Bible? That's fine, as long as they then go and gather empirical data to support or disconfirm those ideas, and don't simply declare that because they got the idea from the Bible, it must be true. The Bible is not scientific evidence of any idea at all. Not a shred of any scientific concept can be bolstered or hindered by agreeing or disagreeing with the Bible. The Bible is no more relevant to scientific data than your hangnail is to the next moon mission launched by NASA. Some argue that scripture is religion. Well, scriptures are a part of some religions, but I would not say that they are on their own are religion. But science is truth. Nope, science isn't truth. It's the quest to become less wrong through rigorous empirical study observation and experiment, and the body of knowledge obtained by this method. Things can be true or false without being scientific. For example, assuming the ichthyists are wrong, and that at least some god concept is sufficiently defined to be discussed, then either at least one god exists or none do. But neither is a scientific statement because such entities are outside the scope of science. And that the two are incompatible. Some religious ideas are incompatible with science, others are not. I would not say that on the whole, all religions are incompatible with science. But that didn't seem to be a problem for men like Newton or Johann Kepler. Heliocentrism, which Kepler discovered and Newton helped explain, is directly at odds with a literalist interpretation of the narrative of the Bible. So having these two claimed by creationists who hypocritically pride themselves on such a reading is a bit rich. Or Charles Bell, whose medical textbook is considered the Magna Carta of neurology. So, his text on neurology established the rights and obligations of monarchs and the nobility in neurology? I mean, that's what the Magna Carta claimed to do for England, although it actually didn't. That's a weird comparison. Maybe it's just that they were both written in AD 1215. Except, no, Charles Bell's The Anatomy of the Human Body was published in 1803. These brilliant scientists found great inspiration for their research through the careful study of scripture. Which is fine, but that's not where they got their evidence. They got it through careful observation of the planets and stars, careful mathematical calculation and observation and measurements of things here on Earth, and through careful dissection of human cadavers. None of that is reading the Bible. So, if the Bible is only a religious book and not valid for science, then you might as well not study gravity, the hydrological cycle, the spherical shape and rotation of the Earth, and the importance of blood in living things. All of those things are discoverable and analyzable without the Bible, and none of them directly contradicts parts of the Bible. So no, we should keep studying them regardless of whether the Bible inspired anyone to do so earlier in history. Since the Bible describes all of these scientific facts. Yeah, I'm going to need some pretty great citations on that one. Except maybe that blood is important, which yeah, is all over the Bible, but isn't exactly some kind of surprise. It's not like the people of ancient history didn't know that animals could bleed out and die. So what's left for the scientist who ignores the Bible? Science fiction. No, it's all of science. Literally none of science requires the Bible, even if some scientists were inspired by it. Even at the beginning of this clip, we were told in direct contradiction to this end bit that scientists are inspired in many places, not just the Bible. I mean, think about it. If this were true, then no one other than Christians or Jews could reasonably make scientific discoveries. But is that the case? No, of course it's not. People of all and no religion make scientific breakthroughs all the time and don't cite the Bible as either inspiration or evidence. Once again, ICR is just pissing on everyone's face and telling them it's rain, even though it very obviously is not. Our antepenultimate, 7th for the day, and 18th overall section is called Global Flood. The book of Genesis describes a catastrophic worldwide flood. Is there any evidence that floodwaters covered the entire Earth? Not even a bit. That idea is entirely and obviously precluded by basically every shred of geological data we have. It is as plausible as the moon being made of cheese. There certainly is. First, this has big Giorgio Sokulas energy. Is such a global flood even possible? Yes, it is. Also, I feel like the heretofore missing evidence of a global flood won't be buried in a short video from ICR, but maybe I'm wrong. Genesis says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. 
And the Christmas Carol says that Ebenezer Scrooge was visited by three ghosts. That's not evidence it happened, I'm afraid. Also, the only acceptable film adaptation of that book is A Muppet Christmas Carol. And no, I will not be taking questions on this statement. Today, oceans cover about 70% of the globe. On average, they are much deeper than the continents are high. It looks like the water from the flood is still here. This requires compelling reasons to think that the oceans were significantly shallower in the past. None has ever been hinted at. This argument is just, well, if things were different, they'd be different. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. But have you got any reason to say that they were different? Continuous water-deposited rock layers span whole continents. So do wind-deposited rock layers, and that's not something that can happen in the middle of a flood. So I guess that's no flood as the cause of those geological layers. That doesn't happen with local or regional floods today. Nor did it in the past. Those are mostly sea transgressions, not floods. A marine deposit can't just be called a flood deposit. Flood deposits are high-energy depositions characterized by highly graded bedding, a lack of bioturbation at all levels except the top, and an absence of ichnofossils, again except at the very top. But the rocks of Earth are not primarily made of such graded bedding without bioturbation and ichnofossils. Much of it is ungraded, low-energy deposition, full of bioturbation, etc. This cannot be made during a flood, and is even more absurd when the flood is supposed to be worldwide. These widespread layers contain most of the world's fossils. At least 95% of these fossils are marine invertebrates like clams. Here's a fun thing. That number was just made up one day as a guess by the OG Dr. Henry Morris of the ICR during a chat, not even a formal talk. It's not based on anything, because who would bother doing a statistical survey of what most fossils were? What would that tell us about the ancient past or modern life? Nothing. It's like when AIG says that the average dinosaur was the size of a sheep. They got that from the peer-reviewed paper Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. Again, because who would bother asking that question? The answer tells us nothing about the lives of dinosaurs or their past environments. And we find them mixed with land or swamp creatures like tree shrews, insects, turtles, birds, and dinosaurs. Actually, most of the time in marine deposits, we don't. We usually find such animals in freshwater deposits, such as fluvial or lacustrine deposits. That's made by a river or a lake, respectively. Although occasionally we do find terrestrial animals in marine deposits. In both cases, it's because of this thing that sometimes dead animals do, called ending up in the water. If you've ever seen a dead animal float down a river, you'll be familiar with this phenomenon. Also, saying birds and dinosaurs is like saying cats and mammals. You can just leave it at dinosaurs. That covers birds, since birds are a group of dinosaurs. It looks like an enormous but short-lived flood buried them all with fast-moving water. No, it doesn't, because then they'd be hydrologically sorted, with dense smooth things like shells all concentrated at the bottom, then basically sorted by size. But that's not what we see. There are big and small, smooth and jagged, dense and light organisms at all levels of the fossil-bearing portions of the geological column. There are clams from just a million years ago, and tiny delicate dragonflies from a few hundred million years ago. There is no way to get hydrology to sort this out, unlike what happens in a flood. For example, in the flood indicated in the paper Depositional Model of a Late Cretaceous Dinosaur Fossil Concentration Lands Formation, in which Summer Rose Weeks, working and writing for the Young Earth Creationist Loma Linda University, correctly identified that a graded bedding of dinosaur bones was the result of already rotted carcasses of dinosaurs being picked up in a flood and hydrologically sorted, which is not a broad characteristic of the fossil record. The Earth's surface has flat areas, but also valleys and mountains. Sure does. Gold star to the Institute for Creation Research. Some of the highest mountain peaks, including Everest, have fossilized marine creatures. The Great Flood likely formed many water-deposited layers on the ancient ocean floor and caused tectonic upheavals that buckled those layers into mountain ranges. And when the large amounts of water quickly drained away, it formed steep-walled valleys between the mountaintops. Okay, marine fossils at the top of Everest are found where they evidently lived and died in calm, low-energy depositional environments, including evaporites. Ever get that pink Himalayan salt, whether as a fancy lamp that doesn't have magical powers, even though you might think it does, or in the form of table salt? Yeah, that pink color is fossilized algae from a sea that dried up. Did it dry up during the flood? I don't think that's how floods work. Where the rocks that make up the Himalayas come from isn't a mystery. It's the seafloor between the Eurasian plate and the Indian plate that got thrust up when the two plates collided. That's why the mountains are still growing. For the flood to be the cause of these fossils, these organisms would have to establish whole ecosystems on top of these mountains during just over a year-long flood. Ecosystems can't be established that fast. And again, these ecosystems would then have to dry out, leaving behind layers of pink salt 
under a flood. The actual geology of the Himalayas preclude a flood's involvement in their formation. They don't support it. Most geologists say that the extensive rocks and fossils must have taken great lengths of time to form. But this extends today's slow-paced local geologic processes into the past by overlooking Earth's evidence for fast-paced catastrophic worldwide flood effects. You can't overlook something that doesn't exist. Vast layers, fossil graveyards, and mountains and valleys all around the world point to a massive watery catastrophe. Nope, in fact, most of them would be physically impossible under such conditions. That is, unless the creationists have some secret sedimentation experiments they're not sharing with the rest of us. Okay, our penultimate eighth for the day and 19th topic is dinosaurs on the Ark. Were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? Only in the same way that they were on that spaceship in Doctor Who. What are we doing? Just do exactly as I do! Doctor! No! no! According to scripture, the answer is yes. Well, other than birds, it doesn't say, but even if it did, that wouldn't be evidence for either the flood, the ark, or the presence of non-avian dinosaurs on the ark. Those would all need to be actually confirmed with this little thing we in the being smart and brain having biz like to call actual evidence and not just claims. The next bit is just them attempting to justify their interpretation of the Bible. I don't care, so I won't be responding to it. Well, the Bible says that in the beginning, everything was very good, and there was no death. That means all the animals were vegetarians, even the ones with sharp teeth. It's not just the sharpness of teeth you have to look at. It's the whole morphology, especially the teeth that were used for food processing. It's true that a lot of herbivores have reasons for sharp teeth, but they also tend to have flat grinding teeth. And when you see a serrated tooth curved toward the back of the mouth, there's very little use for such a thing beyond eating meat. Today, we see that fruit bats and pandas have really sharp teeth, and they eat only fruit and bamboo. First, no, pandas occasionally hunt and will eat carrion if it's available, although this is a tiny fraction of their diet. But second, here they're talking about canines. Canines generally are a bad indicator of diet in mammals because they're used for so many things besides food processing. They're used for display, for intraspecific combat, for digging, etc. But what teeth do mammals use to process their food? Molars. And in both fruit bats and pandas, they have flatter molars than their carnivorous relatives. And that is what you need to process relatively hard to digest plant matter. Because plant matter is so hard to digest that it needs to be taken in as a paste, more or less. But meat, being much easier to digest, can be swallowed in chunks, which just require it to be sheared. Which is why carnivorous mammals have shearing molars. Oh, and what kind of teeth did herbivorous dinosaurs like ceratopsians or hadrosaurs have? Right. Flat, grinding teeth. Or, in the case of sauropods, they had gastrolus to do the same work, while having blunt peg teeth for stripping leaves off twigs. So it's possible that T. rex was a vegetarian on the ark. No, it's not. T. rex is entirely unsuited for eating anything but meat. If it swallowed plant matter, it would just poop it out with essentially no nutritive benefit. We can also tell because of the small gut in most theropods. Herbivores require big guts, again, because of how hard it is to digest plants. Just compare this top-down view of a T. rex and an ankylosaurus. See how the ankylosaurus is basically ball-shaped? That's to accommodate a big gut. You can see the same thing with gorillas, who are mostly herbivorous and have big guts compared to, say, chimpanzees, who eat a lot more meat and eat more easy-to-digest fruit than tough plant matter. Did T. rex ever consume plants? Probably. Most carnivores will take in some plant matter from time to time, even hypercarnivores like cats. But could it reasonably ever be construed as an herbivore? No, not in the slightest. And since God needed the animals to be young and healthy on the ark, I hate that ICR actually had a sauropod with halfway decent feet. They were probably also small. Crocodiles and pythons can be huge, but when they're young, they're pretty small. And small animals don't eat as much. Pound for pound, juveniles actually eat more. Just feed some teenagers and you'll see what I mean. That must have been how it was with the dinosaurs. The ones on the ark were young, small, and didn't take up much room or eat a lot. It's like they never cared for a baby. Babies require constant feeding and attention. This is not a good solution. And after the storm was over, God commanded the animals to go out and fill the earth with their offspring. For young, healthy animals, this wouldn't have taken long at all. Kind of like how we saw animal and plant populations bounce back after Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. Oh, did they bounce back from a total drowning of all plants and a reduction to just two individuals per family, not species, in the Mount St. Helens area? No. I didn't think so. So even though God had to rid the world of evil with a global flood, which he didn't, he could simply wish away anyone who was sufficiently evil, the flood was entirely unnecessary. He made a way to save people and animals on board the ark, including the dinosaurs. 
who then promptly went extinct anyway, making it a pretty dumb method of saving the dinosaurs. In fact, it's not just the dinosaurs. The vast majority of vertebrate groups ever to live on land are extinct, and if they were all on the Ark, that gives the Ark a success rate, kind of like the lifeboat fleet on the Titanic. You know, not very good. Our 10th, final, and 21st overall topic is flood stories. I think there's a theme today. Just about everyone knows the story of Noah and his ark, how it rained for 40 days and nights and flooded the whole world. Only eight people, Noah and his family, survived with all the animals he put on the ark. Pro tip, if you start your video script with everybody knows or something like that, and then you go on to explain the thing you just said we know, it's really annoying. Even if we didn't know it. If we did, it's boring, and if we didn't, it's just a bit insulting. But did you know the story of the global flood has been passed down through other cultures for millennia? The Hualapai tribe of northern Arizona has a legend about the whole earth being flooded after it rained for 45 days. Their account includes an old man similar to Noah, as well as a dove. Okay, well let's see. The Hualapai do have a flood legend, although it apparently wasn't published until 1912 long after interaction with Christian people, so we can't rule out that it was in part inspired directly in modern times by the Bible. But the only account of a legend that I can find that isn't from a creationist source doesn't mention the length of the flood and says, There had been a big flood, and the earth was covered with water. No one could stir but Pakitha'awi. And he went forth carrying a big knife he had prepared of flint and a large heavy wooden club. He struck the knife deep into the water-covered ground and then smote it deeper and deeper with his club. He moved it back and forth as he struck it further into the earth until the canyon was formed through which all the water rushed out into the sea of the sunset. Then as the sun shone, the ground became hard and solid as we find it today. There is no boat, there is no reported casualties, no dove, the man doesn't seem to be old, at least not in the only non-creationist source I can find, and rather than the floodwaters receding naturally, some dude hit the ground so hard it made the Grand Canyon. This does not sound much like Noah's Flood. Instead, it sounds like a legend about the Grand Canyon. It takes more than just some random story with a flood to be a corroboration for Noah's Flood. There are stories about droughts, famines, trickster gods, shape-changing monsters, etc. all over the world. That's not evidence on their own that such things are real. The Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh also has a flood story with a large ship built of wood and pitch. Yes, and is older and from the same area as the story of Noah from the Bible. So if anything, the Bible is a retelling of this myth, or more likely, they're both dependent on a common source. But they're from a part of the world where catastrophic flooding was something that happened every few years unpredictably. It makes sense that they'd have flood legends. That a flood legend exists in a culture that we'd expect to have such legends is it evidence that the legends are true. Greece, Egypt, China, the Pacific Islands, India, and many more cultures have their own flood stories. Of those, only Egypt and Greece have a single culture. The others were just big regions with lots of cultures, including China. The Egyptian flood story is a story about a flood that didn't even happen, and it was blood, not water. So that's pretty easy to dismiss. The flood legend in Greece is the flood of Deucalion, and it was not global, only affecting lowland areas and river valleys, and only Deucalion and his wife survived in a wooden box. There's no indication of them bringing animals, or that the flood would need them to, not actually being global in extent. Then, when the pair got out of the box, they threw rocks behind them which sprung up into new humans. Not at all like Noah. The details vary, but many include humans and animals that were spared, usually aboard some kind of vessel. Yeah, because that's an easy way to explain why there are still people and animals. But as we've seen, the flood stories they cite don't even always include those things, yet apparently they still count as evidence that the specific flood legend found in the Bible is actually the totally real one, you guys. And these similarities give further evidence that a great flood really did cover the earth a long time ago. Even if all the stories were identical, it wouldn't be enough to overcome the overwhelming preclusionary evidence from geology. Geology supports this too. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the f*** did you just say? from giant whale fossils found in the middle of the desert. Yeah, like the Sahara, a low-lying desert that would be under a regular old sea if ocean levels rose a bit, which we know they did, and which are not found in flood deposits, but regular old marine deposits. This is once again evidence against, not for, a flood. To water deposited rock layers that span whole continents. Again, they'd have to be shown to be plausibly flood deposits, which they categorically are not. Our Earth shows physical evidence that a catastrophic worldwide flood did happen. No more than it shows of being flat, in that it shows at every turn that it's just not true. But only Genesis gives us the most detailed and accurate account. I can't speak for the detail, as I haven't compared all flood legends for detail. But then I doubt ICR has either. 
But as for accurate, literally the only reason they say this is because it's the one found in the book that they have decided against all evidence is the one that's literally historically true. This comes down to, this one is true because it's my favorite. That's not a good reason at all. Well, that's it for this time. The next section will be Little Grand Canyon. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please hit like and let me know in the comments. If you didn't, go ahead and hit dislike and tell me off in the comments. Either way, please do subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Tapioca Weasel, Klaus Jepsen, Ben Hovind, Kevin Brostek Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, Monkey They Them, San, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Thilhavara, Ian Chen, Mrs. Spexander, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Scriptic Mystic. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. The people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.